It must be spring. All the doors are open, the fans are on. And I'm sweating. People are everywhere. And next week it's supposed to be cold again, so we'll turn the heat on if we need to. All right, welcome to First Universalist Church of New Madison on this beautiful spring day. The uh, daffodils, you know, there's early, middle, and late daffodils. These are the late daffodils, so this may be the last day for daffodils. But I did have a few tulips come up. We'll see if the squirrels left any more. Uh, the tulips don't seem to last very long. I plant them and they go out and there's nothing there, so I'm assuming that's squirrels. Do we have any announcements? All right, next week is, uh, uh, what's her name? Crystal. Crystal, I blanked on that. Crystal's going to be here next week. We don't know what her topic is going to be, uh, but she always does something that's interesting, exciting. She picks her own music and does a complete service, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, today we're doing the, the uh, Holocaust, the last series of the Holocaust. I've got a couple movies or a couple uh, PBS things to show. And we have snacks and that type of thing. So you're more than welcome. If you don't want to come to church, you're more than welcome to come afterwards uh, for an hour or maybe an hour and a half. Well, it depends. On, if, as long as people want to stay, we'll stay and keep watching and then discuss afterwards. <coughs> so because this is a repetition or a redo of the Holocaust study, we're going to go at it from a little different direction. This is a little village south of Munich called Oberstdorf. Uh, it's almost on the Austrian or the Italian Austrian line, uh, the demarcation line, the border line, and it is in uh, Bavaria. And if you know anything about Germany, people in Germany look at Bavaria like we look at Kentucky, Tennessee, Louisiana. Bavaria is not only in the south of Germany, it is in the south of Germany. Uh, they are considered uh, very religious, uh, very conservative. Uh, very stick close to home, family and God are very important to the people in Bavaria. This little village, uh, there was a lady named Boyd who did a study of this village along with, and the other thing I guess I need to say is in Germany, each village has a historian, and I don't think it's mandatory, but it's something that's been done by tradition for generations. They keep a history of the village, everything that happens in the village. <clears throat> and in this village, the historian got teamed up with an investigatory uh, archaeologist or anthropologist uh, named Boyd, who wrote a book about it. And I've ordered the book. Actually, I ordered it online. I thought it would be here, but it's not here yet. Uh, do a little more. But she also had a little monograph or a little presentation, which is what we're going to pull from today, on how the people in this small village, what their reaction was to the coming of the uh, National Socialism or Nazis to Germany and what their reaction was during the war, what their activities were during the war and what they felt after the war. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So this is Oberstdorf. This is Oberstdorf today and it is uh, in the mountains so it is a ski village like a vacation village and even in the 30s it was still, even though there were only five or six hundred people there, it was still a place where people came to ski. Uh, and like I say, it was maybe an hour south of Munich, so it's, it's out in the country, but it's not like totally isolated. All right, our prelude is Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. <clears throat> it's a Fanny J. Crosby song. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
trellis lighting is by Jorgas Halaban Lori. I'm not sure, it sounds Eastern European. Birth is a miracle of love and courage, bringing light into the world. Death is a loss of light, but no less an act of courage, for we are born from and return to mystery. Our opening hymn is 97. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. This is an African-American spiritual, it has that African-American rhythm. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home, a long way from home. Sometimes I feel like I have no friend. Sometimes I feel like I have no friend. Sometimes I feel like I have no friend a long way from home, a long way from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone a long way from home, a long way from home. That fits really well with what we're talking about. I have marked in my hymnal that um, we sang that February 25th, 2018. That's the only time that we had used it. That's the only time we've used it? Mm -hmm. I think we need to mark this one as something we need to use a little more. I think it's like I'm finding there's lots of good hymns in here that I really need, never paid attention to till we actually sit here and read them because we can't sing them. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll try and do better. Maybe I can find someplace online where a, an African uh, church is singing these. If not, uh, we may go, we'll uh, go down to Dayton and ask somebody to sing it and we'll record it. All right, uh, our affirmation, choose to bless the world by Rebecca Ann Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting, any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question, what will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition a confession of surprise, 
a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. All right. And... Oh, I missed some things in mine, so we need to go to Joy's and Concern. Well, no, children's story first. Let's go to that. Actually, let me show you. This is Obersdorf at a giant Nazi rally in Nuremberg. I will show you a little bit. Uh, Riefi, uh, Riefenstahl uh, did a, the first really good propaganda piece on Nazi Germany, and we'll, we'll show that at the beginning of our film presentation. This is actually a film from the historian of the people of Obersdorf at the Nuremberg rally. And this is our children's story. Hitler introduced laws that limited the freedoms of Jews. They were banned from going to public places like cinemas and shops and from traveling on public transport. When out in public, Jews were ordered to wear a yellow star, a Jewish religious symbol so that they could be easily told apart from non-Jews. The Nazis told Germans that those wearing the star were enemies of the people. By 1938, Hitler had developed a more extreme policy, and the Nazis planned a night of violence against Jews called Kristallnacht. Attacks were made on shops and properties owned by Jewish people. Synagogues were burned down, and some Jewish people were murdered. During World War II, Nazi Germany invaded and conquered much of Europe, which gave Hitler a chance to impose his racist plans on European Jews. Hitler ordered a rounding up of Jews, as well as other groups he hated, including gay people, Roma gypsies, and people with disabilities. They were arrested, sent from their homes, and imprisoned in concentration camps, where they were forced into slave labor in inhuman conditions. The deaths of millions were caused by starvation and disease. The Nazis designed everything so that concentration camps would be places of immense suffering. Inmates were faced with horrendous overcrowding and were made to share tear and wooden bunk beds. Up to 12 of them were crammed into each bunk, with hundreds of people in each room. Conditions were so dirty that infestations of rats were the norm. Washing and toilet facilities were limited or non-existent, so in these overcrowded, squalid conditions, disease spread easily amongst the prisoners. Hunger was an even greater problem. The Nazis fed inmates barely enough food to keep them alive. Meals would be a piece of bread or perhaps a watery soup made from vegetable peelings. Those fit enough to survive these conditions were forced into hard manual labor. <coughs> Those not fit enough to work would be killed. Millions died because of the brutality of life in concentration camps. But the Nazis built other camps known as extermination or death camps. In these, they deliberately murdered millions of people. That's a little overview of what we talked about the last time we talked about this. Let's go back to you. Questions, comments? Okay, this, this is a sad subject, but the reason we talk about this, number one, as I've said many times, I want to know what drives people to do this, and that's what the little study of Oberstdorf is, a, is an attempt to do. This lady has, has started out trying to figure out why or what happened to the people of Oberstdorf. Uh, actually, the primary question is, what would I have done? As, as you're watching these, these slides and as you're listening, as we talk about Oberstdorf and as we talk about the Holocaust, you need to think, what would I have done in that time, in that period, 
if I was in that place. All right, uh, joys and concerns. Let's start with who can name the last mass shooting? No. This morning? This morning. This morning? This morning. Three kids or four kids were killed in like six shot, seven shot, at a party in Alabama at a park. Like a kid's party, a teenager's party. Somebody got mad and started shooting. At least, they said at least four to six. And this was just a preliminary report. It happened early in the morning. So I don't know if it was a party that went all night. I'm sure it was because teenagers aren't going to get up at the crack of dawn to have a party. So I'm sure it was left over. It was Saturday night is when the shooting was. But they said there were like five or six bodies with sheets on them, plus numerous people going to the thing. So that's Alabama, four to six killed this morning, Saturday, Louisville twice this week. Not only the first one that we knew about earlier, but there was another one in Louisville, I think it was Friday or Saturday, with three or four people killed. I can't even keep them straight anymore. And the people in Tennessee, the registrators in Tennessee, what was their response? They kicked out the two black guys who tried to protest their kids being shot, kicked them out of the, <coughs> out of the uh, Tennessee Senate, the Tennessee legislature. Mm -hmm. And because both of these black gentlemen were representatives of either Memphis, Memphis I think, and Louisville, uh, and inner city constituents, they voted them right back in again. The, the city councils uh, have the obligation to appoint someone to fill an, an empty seat, and they appointed the same people to fill the same seat. So it's a show trial, it's, it's a thing for publicity, uh, and what it's accomplished, I am not sure. But anyway, we light a candle for all the kids who have died, and for all the kids, let's light another candle for all the kids who will die because nothing is being done, as those two gentlemen said, nothing is being done, nothing at all, other than uh, thoughts and prayers. And that hasn't saved anybody yet. Or as we like to say, uh, not one child has died from a book that was banned, but millions of child, hundreds of children are dying from guns that aren't banned. All right, anything else? <clears throat> For neighbors in Richmond, Indiana, the lines. Richmond had an exciting thing. If you saw the cloud, uh, you could see it from here. You could see it from Greenville. You could probably see it from farther away than that. I was at my house in Greenville uh, cleaning up for the next tenant, and I was only there for like an hour and a half, and already, and this was on South Fifth Street, which is the opposite direction of North Fifth Street where the fire was, and I was getting a headache at my temples, which I have never. And I don't, I don't have a very good sense of smell. I don't know if that's age or what's happening, but I can't smell very good. But, and I'm sure that the, anybody else could smell that kind of acrid, burning plastic smell. But uh, I was already getting a headache at my temples, which is, I've never had that before. So I'm assuming that was a reaction to uh, that, the particulates in the air. Uh, I was back there two days ago. The fire has pretty much died down, that black smoke is gone, but there's still kind of a gray haze hanging over the city. And it's particularly bad if there's no wind to blow it away, at least when the fire started. Uh, unfortunately for Eaton, it was blowing from Richmond toward Eaton. It was actually going right over the city of Eaton and right over Ohio. Uh, <coughs> the next day, the wind changed and blew north up into Randolph County, so it went over Randolph County and Wayne County. So at least it was spread around. And interestingly enough, uh, the EPA has done like seven or 800 studies, air quality studies, and not found anything hazardous in the air. That makes me just a little suspicious. Uh, they found particulate matter. They found the, the particles of plastic floating along, but they didn't, asbestos. As, yeah, they didn't say anything about asbestos. They did find asbestos. Yeah, they found asbestos. But they didn't find any hazardous chemicals, which I find a little hard to believe. So and maybe Test, that gives testing, us, the testing must not be very good. Or it kind of opens your eyes a little bit because when the Palestine or Palestine train wreck happened and all the people were getting headaches and, and nauseated and everything, and then the EPA was saying there was nothing bad in the air. Uh, something's there's the two things are not matching up. Well, it's a means they use to test, and also because of tremendous atmospheric winds, no matter what elevation. It dilutes it so finely it's very hard to pick up yep. through chromatography or any of the spectroscopy, <coughs> any of the more sophisticated methods. And it's possible they're doing a spot check 
where they check like an instantaneous example. Whereas if you're there and breathing it 24 hours a day, it has a cumulative effect. Whatever, we, uh, we put our faith in science, but we know science is not infallible. And even scientists will tell you it's not infallible. They'll tell you that science is continually progressing and we need to make more progress in finding out what to do with that. Uh, we still have our sunflowers for Ukraine. This like this like one for just that topic of Mother Nature sometimes is the best arranger arranger of flowers. Naturally, we see that on the border of our church out parking lot this morning with various colors of violets mixed with dandelions. Um, that's life for spring and the beauty that surrounds us despite the adversity in the world today. Yeah, we have a tendency, I guess, or at least a danger today of being way on the dark side. Uh, we're talking about something in human behavior that's not very good. We're talking about history that's not very good. We're talking about reality that's not very good. So let's not forget uh, the good side, the flowers, uh, the spring weather, the farmers are in the field, uh, cows are giving birth. Uh, my horse is still home. I haven't got him out yet, so but we're working on that. All right, uh, another one I wanted to bring up was there's an immigration package in Florida that they've just passed that makes it a felony to shelter or transport an undocumented immigrant in the state of Florida. It invalidates any out-of-state driver's licenses that an undocumented uh, immigrant might have. In other words, someone from uh, uh, Massachusetts that gets a Massachusetts driving license and comes to Florida to work uh, if he's not a, if he doesn't have his uh, documentation of being a citizen, they they say he does not have a driver's license and can arrest him for that. <coughs> they also require hospitals to ask patients about their immigration status and report it to the state. If you're sick or injured and go to the hospital, the hospital now in Florida is required to ask you and have you prove that you're a citizen. And if you're not, they have to call the state and tell them that we have an, an undocumented immigrant in our hospital. Keep in mind, this is the exact same things that passed in Germany in 1933, 1934, 1935. The same things are happening. All right, any other joys or concerns? All right. uh, we have a joy of the beautiful weather and the fact that we are able to gather together and the fact that there are a few people still watching on Facebook, so I hope they're gathering something of value uh, from what we're doing here. All right, our message is Oberstdorf is us. Let me start with a little story in Oberstdorf. <clears throat> uh, let me let me do the get down to it. It's a small village, and the history of in the Third Reich raises big questions about complicity. Uh, this is a, some of these pictures are by Stephen Mueller, and uh, as I say, the book is done. Uh, by this, uh, this author who is an archaeologist and an anthropologist. At first sight, it would seem unlikely that the Bavarian village of Oberstdorf has much to tell us about the Third Reich. Perched on the border with Austria, it's the most southern village in Germany, 100 miles southwest of Munich. Yet such was the grip of National Socialism on the German society that even in this remote place, there was scarcely any aspect of Nazi rule or of the Second World War that did not touch its 400 odd inhabitants in one way or another. And that was 400 at that time, 4,000 they're estimating now from the picture there, I'd say it's probably a little more than 4,000, maybe not. Their accounts in turn shocking, revealing, and moving lead us to ask that all important question, what would I have done? Like so many of their fellow citizens, Oberstdorfers, deeply Catholic and conservative by nature, were drawn to Hitler by his promise to implement a strong government, to expunge the ignominy of the Treaty of Versailles. This was right after World War I, which uh, Germany surrendered, unconditional surrender to the Allies, France, uh, uh, the United States, England, and they were ruthless in their punishment of the Germans. They took the Sudetenland, which was the border between France and Germany, which had been German, was spoke German. Uh, France took that territory back to keep for France. <coughs> they made the Germans pay reparations. And if you remember, uh, after the 1917-18, then you had the 28 Depression, 
nobody had money, nobody had anything. The people in Germany were starving and yet they were giving their money to the Allies. And the Allies had no, no uh, kindness, no forgiveness, no sense that uh, they would help the German people. Uh, nothing, and this, if you pay attention, stimulated the League of Nations and the uh, United Nations after World War II. The United States after World War II instituted the Marshall Plan. We went in and propped up Germany. We want to make sure that did not happen again. But that's not what happened the first time. <clears throat> they were united to defeat communism, to put Germany back where it belonged on the top table of nations. Only a couple months after the armistice, Quakers from England and America were already in Germany, pre preaching their message of hope and reconciliation. Their reports on the countless conversations they held with ordinary Germans make it clear that even though people were cold and starving, even though they were stricken with grief and fearful of the violence erupting in the many cities, it was the humiliation of having their country treated like a pariah that pained them the most. It was the humiliation of having their country treated like a pariah that pained them the most. If you heard conservatives talk, if you heard conservatives on Fox, what are they complaining about the most? The loss of status for white people. Uh, there's the new thing about white people are being replaced by all these immigrants coming in from Mexico and Guatemala and uh, black people from Africa. Uh, they're taking our jobs. They're getting uh, social security. They're getting social support, which is not true. If you're an undocumented immigrant, you do not qualify for social security. Uh, you do not get free medical care uh, other than what it goes to the indigent of any variety. <clears throat> These people are full of um, anger and they're mad at the world for changing around them. And the easiest person to be mad at is the immigrant, the undocumented, the person of a different color, a different nationality, a different race. Humiliation is what drives these people, and you can tell that because what they want to do is humiliate other people. They take great joy in causing pain and humiliation to other people. That is one of the things that always amazes me, is the capacity of people to hurt other people and take pleasure from it. All right, as the driver of the conflict, arguably, arguably has been underestimated. Certainly, Putin's fury at what he saw as the disgrace of the dissolution of the Soviet Empire is often cited as a cause for his invasion of Ukraine. This author is extrapolating this. Part of the problems with the Russians is they lost the Soviet Union. They are uh, humiliated, they are affronted. They wanna proclaim that they are still a great nation. And how do you do that? You use force to hum humiliate someone else in a weaker position. Unfortunately, the weaker person they picked was not quite as weak as they thought they were. Although a majority of villagers voted for Hitler in the March of 1933 election, they were quite unprepared for the draconian measures imposed on them by their first Nazi mayor, an outsider who treated their traditions and institutions with open contempt. Indeed, Oberstdorf was not, only, was not the only rural community that while enthusiastically supporting Hitler, clashed with the local Nazi officials. Nor indeed did the villagers have much time for the stormtroopers whose aggression and noisy parades were so damaging to the tourist economy on which this once poor rural community now largely depended. In common with many other small towns and villages, Oberstdorf residents exhibited a wide range of attitudes toward the regime. Unquestionably, there were plenty of Nazis in the village let's say 20 to 30%, maybe up as high as 40%, kind of I would equate it to the number of uh, rabid conservatives, MAGA people in the United States, many of whom were to remain dedicated to Hitler to the bitter end and beyond. Uh, arrested in uh, New York, brought before the, the court, uh, multiple uh, arraignments coming forward and still there are loyal followers who will do anything to support the, uh, the leader. But there were others who having started out as committed party members changed their minds as it became ever harder to ignore the true nature of the Reich. Ludwig Fink, who is this gentleman sitting down here, 
Obersdorf's second Nazi mayor is a prime example. Initially seduced by Hitler's determination to restore Germany's prestige and posterity, he, like so many others, assumed that once securely in power, the Nazis' more extreme policies and rhetoric would subside. Does this remind you of an administration a few years ago when the Holocaust treatment, uh, the tragedy of blood on the inauguration, and everybody thought this can't be the way this administration is going to proceed, and yet it did by every appointment, uh, by every law that they passed, by every law that they ignored. When on the contrary, they only worsened, we might ask, why did Fink not protest or resign? The truth is that any such act of defiance would have condemned him to a concentration camp or the guillotine. And even had he been courageous enough to accept that fate, what would have become of his family, his wife and two sons, one of whom was epileptic, epileptic would have been left destitute. Uh, Trump just proposed he gave a speech to the NRA uh, yesterday or the day before. In that speech, he proposed a new civil service exam. When he is elected president the next time, every person in the civil service, that means every person that works for any bureaucracy connected to the government, will have to take a questionnaire asking, are they loyal to the president? Are they loyal to the government? Uh, will they do what they're told to do no matter what? This is an exact copy of 1933, folks. We are not joking about this. This is, this is uh, Fink's response to his loss of faith in National Socialism, therefore, was to mitigate as much as possible the worst effects of Nazi rule in the village. He tried to protect a handful of Jews living there. He helped the local nuns when they were targeted by the regime. And that's something people don't realize. The Nazis always said they were very religious and the Third Reich, the thousand year reign was based on religion, except they did not tolerate any objection, any nun or any priest coming forward saying that people should be granted clemency or leniency or people should not be killed out of hand, then they were uh, targets as well. He defended villagers threatened with imprisonment for infringing any one of the Nazis' countless petty rules and regulations, and in the last months of the war, refused to carry out orders to execute villagers attempting to surrender. Uh, that was something that was pretty notable at the end of the war in Berlin. The civilians in Berlin, when the Russians were at the gates, were actually in the city of Berlin. If they tried to surrender, the German troops who were left would kill those civilians. They would hang them from a lamppost. Uh, we've talked about this before. Hitler said, if you don't defend me, if we lose the war, not only am I going to die, you're all going to die. He did not want to save the German people or the German country. He said, if I'm gone, everything is gone. He wanted to destroy everything. The burning question is, how much did Fink and his villagers know about Nazi atrocities? The concentration camps, the Holocaust, the torture, the murder of homosexuals, the Roma or gypsies, the disabled, and anyone else the Nazis didn't like. In the author's view, and her, from her studies, she thinks they knew a great deal. This little boy in the middle, a teenager from the village was gassed <clears throat> in Hitler's so-called euthanasia program because he was blind. This is that little boy when he was a child, and as he grew up as a blind child in the village, even in this little village of 400 people, the Nazis came through, the stormtroopers came through, and as we talked about eugenics, anyone who would pass on bad genes was considered something that was a faulty, subhuman, something to be eliminated from the gene pool so they couldn't reproduce. So even German kids who had things like uh, congenital blindness or epilepsy, remember Mayor Fink's son, he managed to save his son, and I'm not, they didn't say how he did it, but he would have been a target for uh, extermination because he could not be allowed to reproduce. Soldiers who had witnessed or had themselves perpetrated barbaric deeds were continually returning home on leave. At least some of them must have unburdened themselves to family and friends. One man, Heinz Schubert, who claimed descent from the composer's family, that's Schubert, was responsible for organizing the murder of 700 gypsies in the Crimea. What did he tell his wife and friends when he was back in Oberstdorf? 
Later at his Nuremberg trial, he stated, we thought we were saving Western civilization. That's the propaganda that was put out. We are improving the human race by eliminating those who are substandard and felt no compunctions about doing that. Then there were the assorted camps that existed close to the village, a Waffen SS training camp, Dachau's sub camps, and several forced labor camps. Dachau was one of the first extermination camps uh, created, and that was south of Munich. Uh, these are pretty horrific places if you ever go to Germany to visit, and they are nothing but a shell of their former selves. Uh, we went to Sachsenhausen, which was the first concentration camp, it's actually in the suburbs of Berlin. And there are only a few buildings left, but you can see the foundations of all the buildings that were there. You can see the pit where people were shot and buried. Uh, you can see the, the uh, buildings are still left where the, the uh, Nazi troops were stationed. And you can see one barracks that is left with the three tiers of bunks, three people to each bunk, so nine people in one little row. A row of uh, toilets in the, uh, in the room, like one or two sinks, large sinks, long sinks and then a row of uh, basically big pots that you could sit on or urinate into for thousands and thousands of people. And when everything is clean and sterile, you, you cannot get the true picture of what was actually going on there. Every day, villagers saw foreign <coughs> slave workers being marched to and fro and could hardly have been unaware of the appalling conditions in which they lived. At Sandhofen, just 10 miles north of Oberstdorf, there stood a Nazi castle often visited by party bigwigs, including Himmler, who went there specifically to brief local Nazis on the final solution. And the final solution is the extermination camps where it was too slow to shoot people, it was too slow to use uh, trucks with uh, carbon monoxide, so they, they uh, created the Zyklon, Zyklon gas, which was basically a pesticide that uh, displaced the oxygen in the air and you suffocated. And they did, as we talked about before, three and four thousand people a day. Can you imagine three and four thousand people a day being killed, herded into these uh, gas chambers, and then the bodies taken out by slave labor, and then more people herded in? Toward the end of the war, when Messerschmitt and BMW moved their operations out of Augsburg and Munich to escape the bombing, several manufacturers were established in and around Oberstdorf. Because the Allied bombing, the, uh, the uh, British bombed at night and the Americans bombed during the day, the Germans had a terrible time trying to keep up war production. So they moved their factories underground, they moved them to small villages, they, they uh, camouflaged them, and yet they still managed to turn out tanks, artillery, munitions, helmets, guns, everything that's needed for war. Uh, they were are pretty remarkable people. They had no oil of their own. They created oil out of coal. They liquefied coal and turned it into gasoline and diesel fuel. Uh, just amazing technologies. Uh, they launched the V-2 rocket, the V-1 rocket, the first rocket to, to enter the uh, upper atmosphere. Uh, amazing technology and what a terrible use to put it to. But these factories were moved down into the small villages and out in the country. So the people of Obersdorf, they had to have some knowledge of what was going on in the war and because of the family members who came back and told them stories of the people they saw marching these factories when they came they all used slave labor there weren't enough germans all the german men and boys were in the military now so the people working in the factories were slaves and basically worked to death that was the intention was to work them hard enough and kill them and then bring more slaves in and, and do that so they accomplished two goals at the same time but the people in the village couldn't help but see these stick-like figures marching through the town uh, with rags for clothes. All right, uh, while villagers loyal to Hitler blamed reports of atrocities on enemy propaganda, does that sound familiar? Uh, if you hear something bad is done, it's fake news. It's not real news, it's fake news. Those who had detested the regime from the start needed little convincing they were true. Most Orbersdorfers, however, once they realized how catastrophically they had been duped, just wanted to keep their heads down and somehow stay alive until it was all over. Don't remind me, don't tell me, don't do anything. Immediately after the war, when the Orbersdorfers, like Germans everywhere, came close to starvation, they were too absorbed in trying to rebuild their lives to spend much time contemplating their own 
or Germany's culpability. Their one overriding desire was to extinguish all memories of Hitler and National Socialism. Since then, Germany has been impeccable in examining its Nazi past, but there will always be more questions. In recent time, the focus has shifted from the leading figures of the Third Reich to ordinary Germans. The dilemmas they faced, the moral decisions they made, and what can only be described as the most far-reaching tragedy and crime in human history. I have another to bring us up to date. Can you see what this is? There was a teacher in a uh, fifth grade class. I forget where it was now. I saw it and I forgot to save it, so I'm doing it all by memory. And there was a good picture, and I can't, I couldn't find it back, so I had to make my own picture. The class had always had a goldfish in a bowl, and one day the teacher went to the bowl, took the little net, and scooped the goldfish out and laid it on the table. And then she walked to the door and said, anyone who gets out of their seat will be dismissed and taken to the principal's office. You are not to leave your seats. And then she left the room. What happened? That little fish flopped and flopped and flopped. What happened? One little girl jumped up and put the fish back in the bowl. And the teacher came back in and said, what is the lesson for all of us? No matter what the rules are, you do the right thing. <clears throat> no matter who tells you what's right, what you can do, what you can't do, you do the right thing. That's what the dog is doing. <laughs> that dog picked up those goldfish and put them back in the bowl. So. Okay. Actually, let's go to... This was Oberdorf at the period that we're talking about. It was, just, it was just a tiny village, but you can see the mountains behind it, so they have skiing going on there. Questions? Comments? Are you done with the Holocaust? That dog was pretty small. What's that? That dog was pretty smart. <laughs> Dogs are pretty smart, and I was just seeing another thing about uh, Raven was doing something. I can't remember what. I'll bring it because I'm always intrigued by those things. But animals are smarter than we give them credit for. Uh, we talked before, I think, a little bit about that, and I keep seeing more, more uh, Im impressive uh, things. I've been doing a little bit of studying on horses. Uh, how sensitive they are and what good memories they have. If you see some of the things that horses do uh, with the five-gated, three-gated Tennessee walkers, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive the memory that they have. Uh, so, anything else? Jim, maybe it's also a question and a whole different direction with this. Obviously, the, the fatalities, the horror that accompany this has been painful to listen to to this day. But as well, obviously, to endure, and those people actually have to endure it. If you look at it in a different direction, you mentioned that Germany sort of addressed their atrocities in the more modern times. Yes. And they began to heal. What is it that they did, and how did they mobilize people that probably were dealing with a phenomenal sense of guilt? What was it that the country did, or the universities did, or the average person? How did they get others to heal? How did they get others to come back and say, we did something terrible, we're not gonna put under the carpet, we're not going to hope that it goes away, we're not gonna counter it with sound bites of false information, but how do we get on with life? Well, obviously, initially, they had to address the damage caused by their country and the wars that they had been through. But then more importantly, you look at leaders, as Angela Merkel, who's no longer, I think she's out of office now. Yes, she's but what did she do to continue that healing notion? Obviously, she welcomed immigrants, despite the conservative right opposition that still remains in Germany. But more importantly, I guess, I'd be interested in knowing how the diplomats, how the politicians, how the historians, how the church, what did they do to mobilize people to say, 
We did something terrible. The whole world's looking at us as evil people. This is 1950. What are we going to do about it? So just that just occurred to me. I know nothing about it, but I just thought, and I'm not making any suggestions, but I'm just thinking, what is it that they do? Because if we truly address the hyper-partisanism that's in our country today, the divisiveness that was probably there before, but certainly as a result of our former president, how do we get on with it? Specifically, and more importantly, while it's still going on to a lesser degree, and as we look to the future, how are we going to begin to heal and say, stop butting heads and compromise and produce productive legislation to move our country forward? I think they set the example for reconciliation. Uh, the Germans, as I, th I think I've told you before, every school child goes through education of what happened in World War II. It's not like in Florida where you're not allowed to talk about race or you're not allowed to talk about slavery and you're not allowed to say that America did bad things because America is the greatest country in the world. Germany thought that before World War II. They thought they were the greatest country in the world. After World War II, they said, look at the terrible things we've done. We don't want to do it again. Every German school child goes to Dresden or to uh, Dachau or to any of the German concentration camps, Sachsenhausen, and they have an actual lesson plan and they study that and they learn about what happened there. The South Africans took example from that and started the reconciliation. If you remember, after the end of apartheid, they did not try to uh, criminalize people, but they had those people come and confess what they did and say it was the wrong thing to do and then they were accepted into society. It, didn't, it wasn't perfect, it didn't do the perfect thing every time, but it was an attempt. Archbishop Tutu made an attempt to reconcile people. Willy Brandt was the premier, the chancellor of Germany right after World War II and was there for eons. He was just gone just before I got there. But he was a, a remarkably insightful leader who helped lead Germany in that direction. What also helped was they had a real example right next door of what happens if you don't do that because they were right next to East Germany and the Soviet Union. They saw the revolt in Hungary where tanks came in and shot people and killed people. They saw the Berlin Wall where their, their friends, their neighbors, their family members were killed trying to escape an oppressive regime. That kind of gives a little, burns a little fire under you to say, we believe in democracy. We believe in the choice of people have and the, the uh, desire to do the right thing. That is something that I don't know how to instill in our MAGA people uh, when they choose to do the wrong thing. I don't know how to inspire that, but I know if we ever get past it, reconciliation will be part of our, part of our duty, not to hold a grudge, not to act like the people we despise act, but to accept them into the human family and to have them behave as educated, intelligent, sensitive adults are supposed to behave. Uh, and hopefully they will sometime. Anything else? Okay, uh, we're over here. Offering. If you have something and wish to share, please do. If you need something and wish to take, please do. Uh, we are here for everyone.
Our closing hymn is 113. Where is our holy church? A valid question. Yep. Distinguishing the Chalice, Go in Peace, Seeking Justice by Jim McGall. <clears throat> when I say go in peace, I don't mean go in mindless oblivion. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go without challenging yourself or others. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go in comfort. When I say I mean go in peace, seeking justice justice. I mean go in peace, committed to equal rights and opportunities for all. When I say go in peace, I mean go in the peace that is created together. We build communities of true solidarity and <clears throat> compassion and fierce, unrelenting love. Go in peace. Our postlude is praise the Lord.
Special thanks to Roberta for shouldering the entire musical repertoire for today. Uh, that's a lot of work and we certainly appreciate it. Um, I have two pictures of Between the Years in two national parks. Do you know which ones they are? One's a buffalo, so that's Yellowstone. And the other is a lake, so that's Glacier National Park. So wouldn't that be fun to be able to take your horse to a national park like that? All right, uh, let's see if we can get to other. people saw in the 30s and 40s, this is the propaganda that brought all of the German people together, and Lily Riefenstahl is the first, she was a female producer or uh, director, which is pretty amazing that she created this, and was the first one to get behind this whole German propaganda thing, which was pretty impressive, and where's the picture?
I think that's the one we need to get. Yeah, yeah. And if we want to do this again in a couple months, we can do two. Mm -hmm. I think I don't want to have the most people in our disaster. Yeah, yeah. It's it is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
program possible. Support your local PBS station. Thank you. 
the particularity of what happened. Here's the tragedy. Millions of people have not been rescued. They're in the hands of the Germans, they're in the Middle of Eastern Europe, they're in Germany and Austria, and France and Belgium and the Netherlands. But there were people who had gotten to Portugal, who got to Spain. There are people who would eventually get to North Africa. If you had taken more people from those places, maybe more refugees could have come in. Maybe more people escaping could have come in. Are we talking of rescues of hundreds of thousands? No. But if it's your case, it doesn't matter if it's one. Just before the United States entered the Second World War, Germany had barred the immigration of Jews from any country it had captured. For them, occupied Europe had now become a prison to which Adolf Hitler held the key. Americans were still in no mood to welcome immigrants. The anxiety about alien subversion that preceded Pearl Harbor only intensified afterward. FDR declared the West Coast a military zone and forced 120,000 persons of Japanese descent who lived there into internment camps. Most of them were citizens. The Justice Department also interned thousands of so-called enemy aliens, German and Italian immigrants suspected of fascist sentiments. This war can end in two ways, Hitler insisted in early 1942. Either the extermination of the Aryan peoples or the disappearance of Jewry from Europe. Within a few months, the first reports reached the American public that the Nazis had begun systematically murdering every Jewish man, woman, and child on the continent. Jewish Americans and their supporters pleaded that somehow something be done to stop the killing. But President Roosevelt and his commanders were convinced that only by crushing the Nazis and winning the war as soon as possible could the Allies put an end to it. The mantra was, we'll rescue these people by winning the war. The problem was, and many people knew this, and certainly within government circles, by the time the war would be won, very few of these people would be alive. But the dominant idea in the American government is any act of rescue will be a diversion from the war effort. Both could have been done at the same time, but clearly nobody wanted these people. It's not one of the things that will go down in the long annals of good things America did. It goes in a different way. Writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me. Not only because I've never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13 year old schoolgirl. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I feel like writing and I have an even greater need to get all kinds of things in my childhood. In Nazi occupied Amsterdam, Otto and Eva Frank struggled to live as normal a life as possible for their family. June 12, 1942, was their younger daughter Anne's 13th birthday. Among her gifts was a diary that she was soon filling with profiles of her classmates at the Jewish Lyceum the Germans now required her to attend. The girls she liked and those she didn't, and the boys she liked, and those who seemed to like her. For the Franks and other Jewish families, including their neighbors, the Geiringers, refugees from Austria, 
Life under the Nazis was now anything but normal. The first few weeks, nothing has much changed. And so we thought, oh well, perhaps they don't want to do anything in Holland. The Dutch people were very um, typical, you know, they said, um, you are, you belong to us, we are going to protect you, you don't have to worry about anything. But they didn't really count on the measures which the Germans were going to take gradually. And the first year, it became a nuisance. It interfered with our way of life, but it was not dangerous. We were not allowed on public transport, for instance, but we all had bicycles. But then you had to enter into a bicycle. And then we had to wear the yellow star, which means that people walk in the street and are recognizable as Jews. And that started to become really dangerous because people just disappeared. I didn't want to wear it. I was stubborn. I said, well, I know I'm a Jew. Why do I have to wear a star? But everybody had ID cards. And on Jewish people, ID card, it did say you were a Jew or sometimes it was a Jewish stamp on it. So if you would have been stopped without a wearing a star and then asked for the papers, they would have been deported immediately. July 5th, 1942. A few days ago, as we were taking the stroll around our neighborhood of Berlin, Bob began to talk about going into hiding. He sounded so serious that I felt scared. Don't you worry, we'll take care of everything. Just enjoy your carefree life while you can. That was it. Oh, may these summer words not come true for as long as possible. The Frank family was in constant danger. They saw they had been slowly moving their belongings to an annex in the warehouse at 263 Prinzengrad, in which Otto Frank's business was located. A few trusted Gentile employees had agreed to help the Franks survive in hiding when the time came. We'll leave of our own accord and not wait to be hauled away, Frank said. But then a registered letter arrived. Anne's older sister, Margot, just 16, was to be included in the first group of Jewish refugees in Holland to be sent to work in the German labor camp. The Franks went into hiding the next morning. Since Jews were now forbidden to ride on streetcars or on bicycles, they were forced to carry their remaining household items through the streets. So there we were, walking in the pouring rain, each of us with the satchel and the shopping bag filled to the brim with the most varied assortments of items. The people on their way to work at that early hour gave us sympathetic looks. You could tell by the faces they were sorry they couldn't offer us some kind of transport. The conspicuous yellow star spoke for itself. The two floors that Anne would call their secret annex were accessible only by a single door blocked by a bookcase and cramped even before they were joined by four more Jews in need of a hiding place. The same week the Franks disappeared, their friends the Geiringers did too, and for the same reason. Eva Geiringer's older brother Heinz, like Margot Frank, had been called up for what the Nazis called labor service. Heinz was 16, and my father called us together one evening, and he said, we are not going to send hands, it's too dangerous. Members of the Dutch resistance have provided them with false papers and places to hide, but the constant dread of raids by the Gestapo forced the Geiringers to temporarily split up. Eva was to hide with her mother, Heinz with her father. I started to cry, I didn't want to be separated. Because I was very much attached to my father and father. And my father explained if we're in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive 
is bigger. So, survive. So that was really, you know, the first time that I really realized it's a matter of life and death. And that's quite scary that you are 13 years old. What? What do you mean? Will we be killed? About once a week in the night, there was a knock on the door and people had to open up and let them search their homes. The story had been going around that in another house the beds were still warm, they felt the beds. So they demolished the whole apartment until they found the people. And of course the hosts were taken away as well. So of course when you hear stories like that, people said, you know, we can't take this tension any longer, you have to move. So we moved about seven times, my mother and me, to different places. My mother, she used to be in Austria as a lamb, but suddenly she became like a tiger, protecting her children. My father, when we went into hiding, he said, don't worry, don't be long, but Christmas and war will be finished. End of 42, but of course it wasn't. It's the silence that makes me so nervous during the evenings and nights. And I'd get heard you in late June of 42 reports the mass killing of Jews. Like many other newspapers, the Tribune puts it on page six or seven in a tiny little article. You either missed it, or if you saw it, you would say the editors don't think this is true. If they thought this was true, this would be on the front pages. Some papers did put the story on the front page, including the Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American newspaper, which said the Nazis could teach even Southern whites a few lessons. Three years after their aborted voyage to Cuba aboard the St. Louis, Saul Messenger and his parents finally made it to America in June of 1942 aboard the Serpa Pinto, the same ship that had brought Susie and Joe Hilsenrath ten months earlier. Our sponsor was a man in Buffalo who had a furniture store, and he was a relative who we knew in he was a lot responsible. It was great to be in the United States, not to be afraid of, you know, policemen, to uh, be with relatives whom I never knew, but who obviously loved us. And you could feel or see how people were more or less relaxed. Uh, you know, they weren't worried about being with the police and so on. It, it just was amazing. As he settled into life in Buffalo, Saul worried about Leon Silver, a friend he had made aboard the St. Louis, whose family had fled to the same village he had escaped to in the south of France. Six weeks after we had left, his parents must have heard that something was going to happen. They went to the teacher and they asked her to hide Leon. And she did it. And the next day, police came and they took the parents. And then the second day that he was sitting in the school, he decided he wanted to join his parents in the bus school. Went to the police and said who he was. He wanted to join his parents, and he did. He was killed in Auschwitz. <laughs> including all my cousins. On July 29th, 1942, a little over three weeks after the Frank and Geiringer families went into hiding in Amsterdam, a well-connected German businessman named Edvard Schulte boarded a train for Zurich in neutral Switzerland. He had told his staff he would be away on business.
But he had another secret goal in mind. From the first, Schulte had seen the Nazis as a band of criminals. Their war would end only in disaster for Germany. And he had already made this dangerous trip several times to speak with Polish and Swiss agents about likely German troop movements. Now, he had learned from an employee with Nazi contacts that 12 days earlier, Heinrich Himmler had made a formal visit to the concentration camp in occupied Poland, now called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Himmler had spent two days there, had watched the first trainload of 2,000 Jews from Holland arrive, observed the selection of those deemed fit for labor, and looked on impassively as 447 people deemed unfit were immediately put to death using a new method of which Rudolf Huss, the commandant, was especially proud. Instead of relying on carbon monoxide produced by internal combustion engines that frequently broke down, the SS at Auschwitz had begun using commercially available pellets of Zyklon, a powerful vaporizing cyanide-based pesticide that reduced the cost of killing to roughly one U.S. penny per victim. The same method would be adopted at Majdanek, one of the six killing centers in occupied Poland. Gas chambers serve one purpose and one purpose only, to murder as many people as you can, as efficiently as you can. Timur was so impressed, he promoted Huss to Lieutenant Colonel and urged him to enlarge the camp as fast as he could. The program of extermination will continue, he said, and will be accelerated every month. Schulte was determined to get the explosive information to Jewish leaders in Britain and the United States, hoping that they could persuade their government <coughs> to do something before it was too late. In Zurich, Schulte told what he knew to a Jewish banker friend, who eventually passed his story on to a 30-year-old representative of the World Jewish Congress, a refugee named Gerhard Riegner. Riegner hears third-hand that the Nazis have a plan to gather the Jews together in the East and murder them before the end of the year. He obsesses over this. This keeps him up at night. And finally, on August 8, 1942, he decides that he is going to spread this to the world. He is going to get the Allies to do something about this. So he goes to the U.S. consulate in Geneva and explains what he's learned to the vice consul there. Riegner was a serious and balanced individual, the vice consul wrote in his memorandum. But his boss was dismissive and added a covering note before sending it on to Washington, warning that Riegner's story had all the earmarks of a war rumor. That the Nazis persecuted the Jews was undeniable, but the notion that the Nazis were now preparing to kill them all was simply impossible for many in the State Department to believe. State Department officials decide that this is not good information, and, and this is crucial. They say, even if this were true, there's nothing that we could do about it. They believe that they are doing all they can to assist the Jews, and that any sort of rally or petition or protest asking them to do more would be diverting resources from the war effort. Many of these people were also racist, anti-Semitic, and nativist. And so you have to wonder whether some of their um, concerns, some of their annoyances, have to do with the fact that they're being asked to help Jews. But Riegner had also told his story to a British consular official who passed it on to a Jewish member of parliament who passed it on to Stephen Wise, the best-known rabbi in the United States. Wise took it to Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells, who asked him to say nothing until he could find out how much truth there was in it. Wise was nearing 70.